Thank you everyone for joining us um, for this webinar on strengthening platforms and partnerships through continuous learning and evaluation. My name's Nick Vogelpohl. Um, I'm going to be your host for the first part of this session today. Before we begin, I'd like to first acknowledge country and the many Indigenous lands we're meeting on wherever you may be today in the world. Uh, for me, that's Wurundjeri country in Nam in Melbourne, and I pay my respect to their elders past and present. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge any Torres Strait or Aboriginal colleagues with us on the call today. You're very welcome. Thank you for joining us. So as I mentioned, um, my name is Nick Vogelpohl, and I'm one of the directors of Day 4 Projects. We are a consultancy based in Melbourne, and we work mostly in strategy design, implementation and evaluation. And we have a particular focus on working in multi-stakeholder platforms and partnerships. So that means we get to work with clients from all different sectors, across all different fields, looking at a, a real, really broad range of issues and complex challenges. I'm going to give us a bit of a rundown of what we'll be focusing on today before we get into the meat of the webinar. Um, hopefully that was the welcome and you feel like you're in the right place. Um, it has a bit of a catchy title, so um, you're excused if it's not the right one. We're going to start with a bit of a foundational um, discussion around what are multi-stakeholder platforms and partnerships? What do they do? What are their functions? What are they for? And what are some of the things they're achieving? And then we're going to move into a section on continuous learning and evaluation for platforms and partnerships, which is the work that we are really want to concentrate today's session on. You'll have an opportunity to hear from expert practitioners within the field, but we we'll kind of dive into a couple of um, case studies. And then we'll have a panel discussion with some leading experts and practitioners talking about some of those kind of meaty, thorny issues within the world of learning and evaluation in platforms and partnerships. Um, hopefully we'll be, have time to kind of cover some of the next, next steps, but if we don't, I wanted to let you all know now. There's a whole lot of resources and materials that accompany this work and we, have, we, will, we will send them out after the webinar to you, um, including an opportunity to join us in a community of practice. So um, I'd like to introduce uh, my colleague and co-director of Day 4 Projects, Cameron Willis, to take us through this next part. Thanks, Nick, uh, and delighted to see uh, so many folks from so many different partnerships and platforms uh, on the call with us today and from different places in the world. You're very welcome and it's terrific that you've been able to share, to, to join us today. Uh, when you launch something like this, you're not necessarily sure um, will people turn up? So it's lovely that you're here and lovely that you've joined us uh, wherever you are in the world today. Um, as Nick mentioned, we're going to uh, be talking about multi-stakeholder platforms and partnerships. Uh, and I think we recognise that we've got lots of people from lots of places that are working in different partnerships. And so what do we mean by platforms and partnerships and what are some of the different ways that we can understand them? Uh, the Partnering Initiative has done some terrific work uh, for many years um, in this exact space um, and offer a, a definition of partnerships, uh, which is now widely used and adopted by many uh, that are working in this space. Um, and that being multi-stakeholder partnerships, being those involving organisations from a range of different societal, uh, societal sectors working together uh, on a shared vision and common goal. And there's lots more to that definition as well. You'll know that we use the word platforms and partnerships rather interchangeably in the work that we do. And I suppose that's in recognition of the increasing uh, use, use and utility of the word platform within this space as well. And lots of overlaps between what platforms do and what partnerships do as well. Some of you on the call might be thinking about partnerships in the very legal sense of the word as well, uh, where there are legal and contractual relationships that govern uh, how partners work together within partnerships. And that's very true. Um, and there might be other folks on the call that are at, at, at the other end of the spectrum that are thinking about partnerships, perhaps more informally without some of those legal arrangements around that. Um, we like to think about it fairly broadly and to, to welcome those different perspectives um, and those different orientations. Again, recognising there's lots of overlap when it comes to this work. Others of you might be describing or thinking about words like collaborations or alliances, uh, peak bodies in Australia, collaboratives, consortiums, communities, uh, and all of those words are welcome and recognised within this space as well. And I think because at their core, uh, all of those initiatives and ways of working are about working together. Um, how do we combine our talents and skills and resources in ways that can help us start to address some of the complex challenges that are facing societies around the world? 
And it's really those complex challenges that have been in many ways the impetus for the development of partnerships and platforms and many of the partnerships and platforms that we work in as well. Uh, and I think Austin and Satanidi have described this well when they talk about the growing magnitude and complexity of these challenges, really being beyond the, the skills, remits, uh, opportunities of any one single organisation or sector of society to tackle by themselves. So it's really about working together, coming together, pooling our talents and skills and resources in ways that'll help us start to address some of these challenges. And when we talk about complex problems and many of the folks that we work with in this space, the kinds of challenges they're, they're focusing on are things like plastic pollution in the ocean. And we'll hear from Ruth a little bit uh, a little bit later about some of the work that she's doing in that space. We're talking about poverty reduction, community resilience and recovery following disasters and natural disasters, uh, sustainable and ethical uh, agriculture and production, uh, the health of our oceans, deforestation, et cetera. These really big issues uh, around which partnerships and platforms are being formed to try to make some, some advances towards them. Um, and it really, re I think, reaffirms that, that need and the urgency for these types of collaborative structures to bring together uh, those different skills and talents uh, to start making some advances towards these challenges. To date, uh, when we think about platforms and, and partnerships in the context of some of those really complex challenges, uh, there's probably four big buckets uh, of area that, is, that has garnered lots of attention. The first is around the problems that partnerships uh, are, are being formed to, to tackle. Uh, and I've mentioned what some of those challenges are, those really big, thorny, wicked problems uh, that, are, that are in the world that, we, that we're facing at the moment. We also think about types of partnerships and lots of attention has been given to describing the different typologies of partnerships that exist. We can think about that in different ways as well. We can think about partnerships in terms of their functions. Uh, we can have partnerships that are about knowledge exchange, partnerships that are about informing policy, um, partnerships that are about uh, designing, implementing, conducting research, partnerships that are about transforming systems. So those functions that partnerships carry out. We also can think about partnerships in terms of their structure. So who's in them? Uh, sometimes we can see public and private partnerships. We might see research policy and practice partnerships. So what are the structures of the different partnerships? There's typologies for that. And another way we can think about partnerships or the way that partnerships have been thought about is in terms of their goals. What are they designed to achieve? Some partnerships might be about uh, identifying innovations for tackling some of those complex problems. Some partnerships might be about implementing some of those innovations. And often when we think about implementation, there might be words like scaling or accelerating or catalyzing that get attached to partnerships as well. So those are the, some of the different ways that we can think about the typologies of partnerships and how others have thought about the typologies of partnerships as well. The third area that gets uh, attention uh, is around the activities of partnerships. What is it that they do? What is it that we do when we're in partnerships? These are the, the daily, the weekly, the monthly, the yearly things that we find ourselves doing within our partnerships. Some of you on the call will be uh, in partnerships or involved in delivering services or programs to particular constituencies or beneficiaries. Others of you might think about uh, activities of partnerships uh, in terms of things like convening stakeholders and bringing them together, uh, holding space and facilitating discussions and dialogues amongst partners. You might th think of partnerships as uh, catalyzing new thoughts or ideas or indeed new projects or partnerships in and of themselves, advocating for change, amplifying the visibilities of issues. Lots of attention has been given to the types of activities and the types of things that partnerships can do. And finally, that fourth bucket um, on the right hand side, really the foundations of partnerships. And again, lots has been written and thought about in the context of foundations for partnerships. These are really those critical success factors that underlie really effective and vibrant uh, uh, partnerships and platforms. Um, and these will be familiar to many of you. Things like trust and goodwill that exists amongst partners, uh, a shared vision and a common direction of where we're going as a partnership and why we're going in that direction, uh, mutual accountability and commitment to the goals of the partnership and holding each other to account in that work, distributed leadership, reciprocity, et cetera. Those really, I suppose, critical features of what makes for a really successful, vibrant uh, and effective partnership. So, that's some of the areas that have received lots of attention so far uh, as it relates to uh, partnerships and platforms in the context of complexity. Nick's, gonna, Nick's now going to, to think about that in the context of well, learning and evaluation for, for platforms and partnerships. 
Thanks, Cam. Um, so hopefully that, that that's some of the information that you've heard before. And if not, I think there's, there's plenty of stuff out there to read about the processes of partnering, how to build them, what they do, who's part of them. And, um, and, and, and rightly so, a lot of attention has been placed on these things. And we've, we've realised in the work that we do that less attention is probably being paid to the learning and evaluation needs of platforms and partnerships. So that kind of opportunity to reflect on what are they doing? Um, are they achieving the things that they said they were going to do? That kind of in inquiry and examination of what is working and why. Um, and, and I think it's a, it's a real opportunity and time to kind of spend uh, looking at learning and evaluation within these contexts. So I kind of the question is why invest in learning and evaluation for multi-stakeholder platforms and partnerships? And that's your time, your energy, your resources and skills. And I think that we've kind of whittled it down to sort of six options here that I'm going to take us through now. And there's probably plenty more, but some of the ideas behind why you might invest in learning and evaluation. So for that really kind of, um, I suppose, obvious reason to demonstrate progress and achievements. And a lot of programs and initiatives um, have that need to report on outcomes, on impacts and the things that are achieved. I think there's, a, there's probably a difference, though, within platforms and partnerships. And it's to do with the audiences that you are demonstrating that progress and achievements to or for. Um, so within a platform and partnership, progress and achievements needs to be demonstrated to its partners, to the multi-stakeholders um, within the group. Also to funders, if there are funders of, um, of the program, that they might be people that want to hear about the progress and achievements of the platforms. And of course, the beneficiaries of those programs and platforms. So, so who, who are you trying to reach and how are, they, um, how are they affected by the work? That's really important to be able to report on. One of the um, one of the kind of interesting things I think that uh, that bringing a group of people together from multiple disciplines and spaces in a platform or partnership like this is the opportunity to kind of forge new models of practice or new ways of doing things to figure out what works for whom, why, under what conditions. So. Um, one of the opportunities that um, learning and evaluation gives us within a platform and partnership is to kind of document some of those new models of practice and to share them um, with others. The, that sort of leads to this, um, the opportunity then to lead uh, the way in pivoting and course correction. So Cam mentioned before some of the really kind of complex and thorny, wicked problems that we're dealing with in this space, or collectively we're all dealing with. And I suppose that they're complex often because we don't know the ways to deal with them. Um, and so once we invest in learning and evaluation, we can kind of find out those things about, well, what's working? Where should we put more energy and attention? What should we stop doing, etc. Uh, another reason to invest is, is to secure funding or to kind of maintain the funding that's already there. And you know, we, we see lots of platforms and partnerships that are across that kind of divide of public and private and public and private together and civil society more widely. And so being able to um, secure funding and maintain that sustainable funding is a really important driver in, um, in learning and evaluation needs. And linked to that is the again the opportunity to attract new partners um, or retain the ones that you've got because obviously a, um, a multi-stakeholder platform or partnership is really only as good as the people that are in it and are committed to it. Um, and finally, I suppose like kind of stepping out of it at a macro level, um, th this all adds to collective intelligence about what works um, for the complex problems that each of these platforms and partnerships are dealing with, but probably more widely, um, what is working within the platform and partnership space and, and kind of sharing what works is a really important dimension of, um, of this work. So. What we've kind of come up with then in our work in the last um, decade or so, working with platforms and partnerships, is, is, that, is that people are at all different stages of developing learning and evaluation systems within the work that they do. And, and we spend time with clients and with, um, with partners at different points in this process where they are, are building those learning and evaluation systems within their own work. We've distilled this down to what we're calling five key ingredients um, to make that system kind of start and um, and I'm, they're, no, they're in no particular order for a reason because you really can approach this at any point in your own journey. Um, but the first is around a clear and shared vision and that's the thing that, that kind of anchors the work and you can develop that clear and shared vision in lots of different kind of participatory ways um, but, but it is really important that a clear vision exists and that there's documentation of the unique contribution that the platform or partnership intends to make in the world and the ways in which it's going to do that. 
So then you've kind of documented the, you know, the vision, the outcomes, the, and, and there's lots of different words within the aims, objectives of the platform. And linked to that is a set of agreed indicators. And we find that to be a really important dimension when working with partnerships. Um, because they're, they're the things that are going to help us assess progress that's happening along the way. And they really do differ within platforms and partnerships as, they, as, that, as opposed to projects or programs, for example. The third point really is about how you're going to get the information to serve those indicators. And we've called it a data collection plan. And it really is that, a practical plan for how you gather, analyse data at different points within the cycle and, and life cycle of the platform and partnership. Um, and then, of course, linked to that is a sharing, reporting and communications plan. You might call it all three or you might have a different name for it, but it's about having a clear approach for how you're going to share evidence about what works, about your vision, about your contribution to the world. You can start at that point too. You could start with those kind of products or things that you want to share in the world and then fill in all of these other ingredients too. I suppose the, the primary and um, maybe maybe the most important that we've found with all of the platforms and partnerships we work with is developing this culture of inquiry. So if if what you want to do is um, is learn and evaluate what what your platform or partnership is doing, then developing, nurturing, fostering um, a culture of inquiry and of curiosity within the platform among its members, outside of it, to its beneficiaries, is a really important um, dimension and component of this work. Um, so I think, I mean, that's a whistle stop tour of some of these, um, uh, some of these ingredients. And we've put lots more information within the kind of guidebook that we'll share around with, um, with everyone on the webinar after this call. Um, and linked to that are some really practical resources, like how do you actually develop a culture of inquiry? How do you develop agreed indicators? And we've, we'll make them available to you um, over the next few days. So do look out for them. Um, I'm, go I'm gonna hand over to Cam now um, as we move into uh, to, to listening to um, colleagues from the field. Thanks, Nick. Um, for some of you, you might be sitting there thinking that does sound quite quite theoretical. Um, as Nick mentioned, there's a range of different resources we'll be sending around uh, following this webinar. It's got some more practical guidance in there for you as well. Um, but to move us from that theory, really delighted to be able to welcome Ruth McLaughlin and Jessica Romo to our webinar today. So thank you, Ruth and Jess, for joining us. Um, we're going to hear from Ruth first. Ruth is the Impact Management, Inclusivity and Communications Specialist at the Global Plastics Action Partnership. Um, and Ruth's worked in a range of different settings across the broad field uh, of social impact uh, and is really experienced in assessing and reporting on social impact, particularly as it relates to partnerships and platforms. So Ruth's going to share some of her experiences and insights and wisdom uh, when it comes to doing this work uh, through the uh, through the Global Plastic Action Partnership. Thanks, Ruth. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for having me. Um, thank you for being here. This is so fun to be part of this conversation. Um, as Cam mentioned, I'm Ruth McLaughlin, and I'm an impact and inclusivity specialist for um, the Global Plastic Action Partnership. And I'm going to do my best to give some concrete examples today, because when we talk about multi-stakeholder partnerships, they can be very sort of broad and ambiguous. So um, I'll do my best. And then if you have any questions, I'm also welcome, um, welcome questions later on in the conversation as well. Um, so what is the Global Plastic Action Partnership? Well, we are a multi-stakeholder platform, and our aim is to shape a more inclusive and sustainable world through the eradication of plastic pollution. And our members are from all sectors. We work with policymakers, businesses, civil society advocates, entrepreneurs across the global level, and then also really um, focused in specific countries. And what we do, um, is a lot less about implementing projects and a lot more about forming and um, supporting an environment where relationships of trust can be built and where people can collaborate together to make a common vision and common steps towards reducing plastic waste and pollution. And as you can imagine, it's not always easy to evaluate or understand um, and measure how we're making progress and learn from that. So some examples of what we do are um, running baseline analyses within countries to understand what their plastic situation actually looks like. Um, we work to get a whole bunch of 
people from different sectors to work together and come up with an action roadmap for how to actually address that baseline scenario and reduce plastic waste. And in some cases, we'll have hundreds, even in, in one case, 200 different stakeholders all collaborating together to create this roadmap and come up with these shared agreements so that we can all um, work together toward the same vision. Um, another thing that we do is um, form an innovation network that helps connect plastics innovators with the support and expertise that they need um, to scale their innovations. Um, and, and we also convene task forces that work on specific action areas as well. So those are just some examples of the actual tangible things that, that we do working with our members collectively. And once again, everything that we do brings people from across all these different sectors. Another thing that makes what we do kind of challenging to measure um, is that we don't have a cookie cutter approach. So we work really closely with governments and we work at the very high level within governments, but also with people at the grassroots level to understand what's really necessary within a country or within a context. And the more we work with different countries, the more we're realizing that we want to give um, to give unique tools and support in different ways for different places. So that again means that we're constantly evolving and thinking about what we do differently. So um, I'd, I'd love to talk to you a little bit using the framework that Nick just shared about kind of the five key elements about what how what we do is really kind of some of the challenges that we run into. So when we're thinking about measuring our impact and trying to understand and evaluate and learn from it, um, our clear vision, especially when we first started this work, was not clear. Um, we had so many things that we could be doing, so many different people who had different values and different things that they cared about. And our team, we have a secretariat, initially said, you know, everything we do sort of feeds into each other and we all collaborate together and then magic happens, you know, and, and that's not the easiest thing to evaluate. And so it really took a lot of effort for us to, to form agreements on what actually our actions directly lead to and then what they indirectly lead to. And we reached points where we kind of had indicator and framework fatigue, trying to come up with all these answers. Um, but also another thing that we really had to learn was we have this grand ambition that's you know reducing plastic pollution across the globe um, and focusing on our membership and the influence that we have on our membership really helped us to be able to keep things within scope and make what we do clear. So that's something, again, clarity is crucial, especially as we started. Um, and then keeping that um, has, been, has been also a challenge. And then indicators. Indicators have been a lot of fun. Um, getting to the essence of what we do, because we do so many different things and we influence in so many different ways across so many different sectors, the list of indicators can be extremely long and everybody has something different that they care about. So really funneling down to what matters has been a fun challenge. Um, and then our donors don't really understand multi-stakeholder platforms very well. They're used to kind of traditional impact measurement and implementation projects. And so working with our donors to create frameworks that work for them and work for us and almost some education there um, has been fun too. And then when we're trying to create a culture of inquiry, we of course wanna bring in our stakeholders um, to give feedback on our, on our frameworks. Um, but of course, they also have different values and things that they care about. So things get more complicated. And then because things are constantly changing and we're learning and improving over the course of even just one year, our framework also changes constantly. And so we haven't, we've still just gotten to a place now where we have something very concrete. Um, and our team needs to be able to feel ownership of that across all the different changes. So that's a challenge too. Um, and then of course we have people at very high levels as part of our membership. And so collecting data from them can be a challenge. Um, and then finally, when we're sharing information, they really want to see specific things that they care about the most. So coming up with these bespoke kind of pro uh, project reports or things like that can be challenging too. So it's lots of fun. I think it's 
very, it's different than sort of a traditional implementation project. And I've, I know I'm running out of time. So I have four key things that have worked for us that will hopefully be <laughs> encouraging for you as you explore this as well. Um, the first one is that, especially in that early stage, it's easy to get stuck in analysis paralysis. And we could have just tried to come up with a perfect framework and spent years, <laughs> frankly, trying to come up with our framework, but actually just going out there, working with imperfect indicators, working with our best understanding at the time and collecting data, talking to people really helps inform the process so that we can iterate and make it better. So just get out there, you know, it's, it's so helpful. Another one is synthesize. So because we had this massive list, we started a year ago with 80 indicators, you know, because there's so many things we could be collecting data around. And actually now we've gotten to a point where we have 18. And so it's taken a lot of effort and we've had to let go of some things in the process, but, but synthesizing would have been so helpful earlier on as well. Um, with, especially with multi-stakeholder partnerships, qualitative data is key. We had so many valuable conversations because what we do is think about how, um, how people are learning and using our tools and what they've um, gained through relationships with us. And that's not something you can just get from a survey, you know? So those conversations have been super helpful. And finally, my favorite probably, I don't know, I like all these things that we've learned, but shirking the traditional system. So the initial kind of, there's a traditional impact frameworks that are really helpful as a jumping off point, but they're not built for multi-stakeholder platforms um, necessarily. And so letting go of some of those really kind of constricting rules and coming up with what works for our platform has been really helpful while still using those, um, those frameworks as a great baseline and, and starting off point. So that's it for me. Happy to answer more questions later. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ruth. I mean, it's terrific to hear you describe the work uh, of GPAP so, so succinctly and so well. Um, and I'm not surprised with 80 indicators that you had indicator fatigue. Uh, I'm not surprised about that at all. Thank you for sharing those experiences. It's, it's great. And uh, as Ruth mentioned, if you do have questions for Ruth, pop them in the chat um, and we can get those to her. Um, thank you, Ruth. Uh, our second sort of insight from the field um, is from Jessica Romo. Um, Jess is a monitoring evaluation and learning specialist. Uh, and for the last 15 years or so, Jess has worked with a whole range of organisations to help them maximise, describe, evaluate their impact. And she's really working at that intersection of organisational strategy, organisational development and monitoring and learning and evaluation. So she's really at an interesting point when it comes to the application of some of these concepts and theories to help them bring them to life uh, for, for, for those that are working in these types of structures. Um, most recently at the Wellcome Trust. Jess, we're delighted to, to have you on the call today and really looking forward to your insights and comments. Thank you, Cam. Um, let me share my screen with you. Um, I've got a few slides here. Um, can you see this? Great. Let me just try and find the presentation side of it. Uh, okay. Um, so, yeah, uh, I am now. Um, for the last six weeks, um, I'm working as an independent consultant, but um, over the last four years, I've been working at the Wellcome Trust, and I will focus on walking you through the approach um, that um, I followed um, as I was leading the monitor and evaluation and learning function there. And I guess one of the first things I have to say is that um, this is very much focused on a funder's perspective. Um, as some of you may know, the Wellcome Trust is one of the largest biomedical foundations in the world. And really, we work, Wellcome works uh, both in uh, partnerships with other funders and other organizations, and, and, and it also funds partnerships and multi-stakeholder platforms. Um, so with that in mind, I'll just say that generally, um, this type of work, um, it falls within the strategy in terms of interest of, of doing and enabling a culture of inquiry um, is really with the idea of helping Welcome become a more transparent, um, accountable and learning organization. Um, and in doing so, we help them 
uh, improve its contribution or accelerate impact. And these rules, um, we do that through four main um, strategic objectives. And I'll say that um, Nick has already covered some of these and why will you evaluate um, and monitor um, partnerships and multi-stakeholder platforms. Um, and it's highlighted in, in these um, three points, which is about striking progress through monitoring data, really having quality um, evidence of progress uh, in terms of outcome contribution and impact, um, as well as um, really being there to add to overall institutional learning. But what does that really look like in practice for the Wellcome Trust? Um, and in the paper that will be released um, after this event, um, I've included an example here. So I'll give you another one for this um, for this time. Um, this is about um, a strategic, highly innovative program at the Wellcome Trust called Our Planet, Our Health. Um, and what I'll say is that when you're trying to build a culture of inquiry and doing more complex monitoring, evaluation, and learning, you have to take people on a journey and meet them where they are. And that's really where we started. Back in 2018, there was um, a new program director. He came in and we really had to use a push strategy, which means that you know we had to kind of proactively try and develop a trustworthy relationship, some credibility, um, and try to describe the value that monitoring, evaluation, and learning, which I'll refer to as MEL from now on, um, can, um, can do for their area of work. Um, clearly, we, you know, it was early, uh, early days, um, so the program director felt most comfortable leading an external evaluation with me being a, a kind of a, uh, offering support and a critical friend. And I think this demonstrates that when you do MEL, um, you also have to know how to partner with, with, with your staff um, and with clients. Um, and that went well. Um, and a lot of things happened, but just to highlight key things um, over a period of time, a couple of years later, um, we convinced the program staff um, at the back of a new global coalition that they, were, that they set up to influence COP26 to do the first external developmental evaluation that welcome has seen. This means that we effectively hired a group of evaluators to accompany the program from the beginning all the way through to the end, which meant that you know, they were part of the coalition charter, they had a role, um, they're generally um, joining um, all of the um, operational meetings. And, and the point there is to enable real-time join MEL. And really the evaluators are, are playing a critical friend role, but also a role in really helping the partners coordinate around MEL um, and really helping them use to influence how this global coalition is shaped, how it operates, um, and, if, and hopefully improving uh, their effectiveness. So that's really important. Um, and in here, what you're observing is really more of a credible function where we're effectively now using a pool strategy. So people are coming to us uh, for help um, and, and a, bit, a bit of a change um, from where we started. And one of the last things that I did before I left was to help them set up a final theory-based evaluation um, for the second phase of this program, which was coming to an end. Um, and again, it's a jointly managed effort. Um, and there's a specific focus on assessing partnerships that we found of transdisciplinary research. Um, and again, here, I think you can see that we have a more embedded malfunction. Uh, we have already established ways of working and really the, the, the kind of business as usual for them um, has been set up as regular um, evaluation and learning of funding we do um, with our partners and of partnerships. Um, and so I guess what I would like to leave you with is that in my experience, um, the extent to which you can set up a male practice that is highly um, rigorous, um, of high quality and with more complexity um, really depends on the male culture and capabilities that you have within the organization or the program that you're working with. Um, so effectively, you might we might start on a basic level, mainly tracking um, activity and outputs data, and you hope to work all the way through to the advance. 
um, where you're having more real-time evaluation as well as um, more regular use of external evaluation, which tends to be a little bit more credible um, and in-depth. I'll say that key developments um, are really trying to work with senior holders. Sorry, that's my cat. You probably hear her meow. Um, senior stakeholders as champions. Um, so they, to the extent to which you can find your champions at that senior level um, will really allow you to secure funding, um, to a kind of create incentives for their staff to regularly use data and evidence to shape their practice. Um, but also, you know, the extent to which you can build, I mean, in my case, I was able to build a staff with the right capabilities and experience to help us support programs like the one I just walked you through um, and a wide range of other partnerships. And also spending a lot of time building credibility um, and trustworthy relationships across a wide range of functions and teams, um, for me, was really critical in terms of building a mass of allies um, that, again, kind of start normalizing the sense that the use of data and learning for strategy, um, implementation and decision making is, is really valuable and worth investing in. And last but not least, I think it's also worth remembering that um, you can be better embed mainstream and formalized mail through finding ways to uh, collaborate with other key functions. And in my case at Welcome, I found ways to mainstream mail related frameworks and practice in um, how we did um, finance accounts, how we did um, operational annual planning. Um, and one of the last things I did was um, had a chat with the guys at Internal Audit as they were evaluating uh, big centers um, and partners um, that we provide core funding to. Um, so hopefully that's um, some food for thought and I'll stop sharing there. Uh, I'm very happy to add to any of these based on questions. Thank you, Jess. Um, I'm just going to share my screen quickly because we're going to move into um, the panel discussion that we have today. And I'm really um, delighted to introduce our panelists today, all people that I've had the privilege of working with before. And um, the first is um, Nancy Lee, who's currently working at Wilton Park as a health program director um, and has and has a really broad um, and uh, a long experience working in multi-stakeholder platforms with a particular focus on those dialogue platforms and policy making platforms that Cam spoke about before. Um, Georgie Pasolaris, who is currently the Head of Impact Measurement and Management at the World Economic Forum and in that role has um, oversight, I suppose, of the learning and evaluation needs of about 30 different uh, multi-stakeholder platforms and partnerships. And finally, you heard from him before, um, but that Cameron Willis, who is uh, co-director of Day4 Projects and has been working in multi-stakeholder platforms and partnerships for a long time, um, probably 15 years. He, um, he has a particular interest in how you develop indicators and measurement systems for platforms and partnerships. So I'm pleased to have him as a panelist. I don't always get the opportunity to ask him questions. So um, I'll stop sharing my screen now. I have, um, I'm going to be the facilitator if that wasn't clear, um, but I'll, um, I'll start off with a couple of questions and do, um, do make note of any questions that you have in the chat or in the Q&A function as well. Um, but I wanted to start us off today with a question about why we should invest in learning and evaluation systems um, for platforms or partnerships. Um, that kind of, yeah, I mean, we've covered some of the topics before, but I'm interested in your perspectives of why. And I wanted to start with you, Georgie, um, if that's possible. Sure, Nick. Hi, everyone. And just a um, big thanks from me for, um, for the, the privilege of being able to join today and um, super valuable to hear everyone's perspectives. Um, I've been in the role a year and, um, as, as Nick said, you know, have the privilege of working with some 30 MSPs, as I'll call them, multi-stakeholder platforms, all at very different levels. Um, an offer of support is it, it ranges from super hands-on to very light touch. Um, and I mean, we're working um, with incredibly complex issues, as both Nick and Cam have referred to earlier on. And these sort of super interconnected issues really require interdependent solutions. And so the multi stakeholder platforms are addressing deforestation, climate change, um, food security, and a whole range of other sort of common goods issues. And they're, they're hard, right? They're difficult and they take a lot of energy and require a lot of resources. And I think one of the biggest 
benefits um, of doing um, measurement and evaluation and understanding the progress that you're making is to demonstrate the value that they're creating and almost to validate some of that effort and certainly to validate the, um, the methodology of multi-stakeholder collaboration. I think in our case, what I'm also seeing a lot is um, it really helps to drive accountability because with such ambiguous issues, complex nuanced problems and diverse stakeholders, um, these tools can really help clarify what's in and out of scope, who's responsible for what, and as Ruth alluded to, what's really um, measurable or practical within the realm of our remit on this MSP. Um, a big opportunity is the, um, is the communications piece. Right? So being able to really effectively communicate not only what the MSP is doing, because there's a clear articulated vision that stakeholders are aligned to, but also the progress um, as, as that unfolds. And, um, and I think that's a really powerful tool that then helps to validate the purpose, um, helps to give teams as well as stakeholders and beneficiaries confidence that these methods are working. And what we're trying to do is identify solutions through this model of multi-stable collaboration. What's working? And what should we then focus resources on in this incredibly sort of increasingly tight um, resource environment? How do we identify what are effective solutions for addressing these complex issues? So um, so, you know, being able to measure progress is, is key to that. And as, as Nick um, mentioned earlier, in our case, you know, we're looking to mobilize further engagement, collaboration, partners. We want more people to join this, um, this approach and ultimately funds. Um, and so if that's an area of interest for you, um, being able to demonstrate with data that uh, you're making progress, be that through, you know, effective, um, convening mechanisms or through changing the plastics landscape as Ruth, as Ruth talked to. Uh, those are all valid sort of opportunities to demonstrate progress. Thank you, Georgie. They're really interesting. I was just jotting down some notes while you were talking. So that kind of opportunity to, to focus in on the unique contribution that platforms make, the, uh, the purposes of accountability and responsibility and those opportunities to communicate success and progress as well. Thank you for that. Nancy, I'm interested from your perspective I'm at Wilton Park and, and in previous roles too, what, what do you see some of the, the why? Why should we be investing and in doing this work in um, learning and evaluation? Great, thanks Nick. I'd like to say thank you to both yourself and Cam as well for inviting me to participate. Um, I've learned a lot from the both of you from working with you over the years. So I think my three biggest whys, and I think you've covered a lot of this already, is firstly, the impact and the outcomes for beneficiaries. Uh, I completely agree with Georgie, the importance of evaluation to support your narratives. And you all know that narratives um, have a significant impact in helping you communicate. So it's, it's helping you to do that, that narrative to show the impact and outcome for beneficiaries. Uh, the second piece is around return on investment and, and the value add of your project. And again, to maintain funding uh, and to, to bring more funders on board. And thirdly, to keep your project on track and to course change and course correct as and when necessary. And also as part of that, um, learning and continuous learning is of value, both I think at a personal level, but also at professional level and collectively. Um, to go into a, li a little bit of detail of things that maybe haven't been mentioned, I think in terms of, um, of uh, investment and how you measure some of these things, I think some of the, because we are now dealing with, and as, as Cam said, now more than ever, multi-stakeholder partnerships um, and diverse partnerships are incredibly important in addressing global challenges from climate change through to pandemic preparedness, through to the equity issues that we're facing um, globally. And a number of these, um, what I call whole of society approaches. So whether it's um, approaches to vaccine uptake, whether it's approach to climate change um, or to equity, it takes different parts of society and different sectors of society from the grassroots through to the top um, to, to make that change. So how we show our impact at different levels is really important. How we ensure that we're all starting to talk the same language, um, I think is important as well. And just an example of that, uh, and I think Ruth had actually raised that as well, is, is to ensure that you're on, on the same track, is um, agreeing at the start what you mean. So don't presume that but when we say we're going to uh, 
I'm going to say equity for equitable access to AI that everyone knows what we mean. Um, so this is a, a real life example here where we all presume that that means something and we're all going to achieve that through governance principles. But if you go around the room and ask different stakeholders what AI, just AI means to them in the context of access and governance principles, you'll get 40 different answers, which we did. So it's making sure that everyone is on the same track in terms of what it means to them and how you can then get to the end goal. Mm. Appreciating, of course, that different roads will lead to Rome. Uh, I think I'll just stop there and um, yeah, yeah you're, you're just reminding me, I think we've all been, oh, hopefully lots of you on the call today as well have been in those positions of trying to get everyone on the same page and, and agreed on that shared vision and what those things mean. And I think learning and evaluation can help us do some of those uh, tricky, thorny conversations that we need to have. Um, I've got another question. I'm kind of interested in Cam's take on this because we always talk about how to, how to do this. Um, but I'm interested in, in what are some of the pitfalls or challenges or kind of obstacles that you've faced when you're working with, with on, on learning and evaluation systems, Cam? It is nice to be asked a question by you, Nick. How, how different I normally do this work together? How good? Um, it's a good question, and and I know everybody on the call today would have um, would have their own pitfalls and challenges that they've encountered, or indeed have fallen into. Um, and I mean, three three for me emerge as being sort of um, I suppose very common when we talk to folks. The first is this: maybe it's a human tendency to to jump to some technology solutions to help us solve the problem of of say impact measurement or learning and evaluation. Um, and there's lots of really good. Uh, technology solutions that are out there that when used correctly can really help um, and make make that uh, make that process a lot easier. What we often find though is that people tend to jump over all of the hard work in the, the first place to go straight to the to, to straight to the solution. So rather than spending time on resolving those conversations, having those conversations about where are we going, what is our shared direction, what are the, the core outcomes we want to measure together, what are the indicators of change, let's the best time to do that. We jump straight to the tech solution and hope it's going to help us and often it doesn't. So that's the first one. The second one, and has, has it's been mentioned in the conversation already, is this um, misalignment or challenges and alignment between what, say, funders and others um, want to find out about our platforms and partnerships and what the platform and partnership is actually doing and what it's uniquely placed to doing. Um, and so those discrepancies exist for all sorts of reasons. Um, maybe it's a stage of evolution in terms of where we're at, but finding ways that we can better align the work of a, of a platform and a partnership to what we then get to report, I think is another critical challenge for the work that we're all doing within this space. And the last piece um, is really about, Jess, what you were talking to, which is this actually getting people interested, dare I say, getting excited uh, about doing learning and evaluation as it relates to partnerships and platforms. How do you build a culture of inquiry where people are supported to ask questions, get interested, share data, capture data, talk about it, make mistakes? How do you do that in a way which is really exciting and, enga and engaging for people? And Jess, you had some really nice ideas about some of the processes for how that happens and the, I suppose, the timeline and evolution for what that looks like. And I think that really speaks to then sort of that key ingredients um, that we've, we've put into some of our work, which is around culture change. How do you get a culture of inquiry within your organisation? So I think that sort of some of the three key challenges that we often find with folks that are working within this space. <laughs> well, that's, uh, yeah, that's, it's nice hearing you, you say it, Dan, because we do run into these things. And I'm sure a lot of people on, um, on the call have run into these um, issues as well. Georgie, from your perspective, I mean, and just for context, Georgie's working in, in kind of public private partnerships, which obviously have their own complexities to them. But I'm interested, would there be any other pitfalls or challenges that you'd add um, to that list of, from Cam? It's a great list and I'm completely aligned to it. Thinking uh, from from where I sit, um, the biggest struggle in very practical terms are the capabilities, uh, capacity gaps of the teams who need to own this. So I can help them to shape the, the roadmap, the, 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 you know, using tools like the theory of change or the indicators, but actually bringing that to life um, is is proving you know a daily challenge for us all, and so there's three things we're trying to do. One is building that culture of inquiry that they can refer to. Two is building the tools and the frameworks to actually get the stuff embedded, and then three is building the capacity and the capability of the teams um, alongside us to um, to do this in tandem. That's the first. I think 
the second, which um, I picked up in Nancy's comment, is this constant need for alignment. So my role is as you know, champion number one to advocate for the value of this work, but also to constantly remind people of where we're at, where we're going, the purpose is why. They're coming to this cold. Many of those we work with are not impact specialists and do this as a really small part of a very, you know, big job. So how do we constantly build that alignment? Um, and also there's this constant struggle of different assumptions or expectations, perhaps about the scope or the timeframes. That work can be done up front, but the constant need for alignment is, is an ongoing one that can't be underestimated. And the third is certainly um, the point that Bruce mentioned about um, analysis paralysis. How do we go from theory to practice quickly? Because we can get excited and get people more engaged when they see the values that this demonstrates. So quick wins, quick results, and it doesn't need to be on the three-year MSP, you know, long-term outcomes. It, it could just be how do we successfully gather responses and data and feedback from the event that we ran last week and public, you know, publicly sharing those to get people excited. Those would be the, the three that I would focus on. Mm. Yeah, I like them. I'm, um, they, and then they are, they're very real challenges. Those capacities and skills that you mentioned before are obviously really important to have and it speaks to some of the stuff you spoke about before, Jess, the uh, building, a, building a kind of um, a culture and strategy of capacities and skills within a team. Um, Nancy, are there any that you would add? I'm, I'm particularly interested in the, in the work that you've done um, in, multi, in, in, I suppose, dialogue platforms. What are some of the pitfalls and challenges of, of, of learning and evaluation in those dialogue and policy making platforms? So I think one of the greatest challenges is, is the indicators themselves. So outputs are very intangible. Uh, it's, and this is where the, I think indicators are important. So where your, where do you start? That's probably your next question. But in terms of the pitfalls, uh, it's thinking, and the challenges is thinking through what, what my indicator is going to be. Is it the number of people at a dialogue? Is it the diversity of the dialogue? How do you measure outcomes and, and, and outputs? Um, more the outcomes, I guess. So, you know, you've got a report, great, but what has been the outcome of that? Uh, more people have heard about the, the subject that you're talking about, more people are engaged, you've brought people into the conversation who weren't previously. So I think those are some of the challenges um, and also some of the pitfalls as well, getting bogged down in the data and the indicators. Um, once you've gone beyond a dialogue and you have a, a project, um, because of the diversity, as Ruth was saying, there are 110 things that you can be doing in the in the plastic space, but which of those do you go to, to measure, even though people will be doing doing different things? Um, mm -hmm. And so I think to add, there's nothing more really to add except to highlight. I think leadership is incredibly important, both from understanding, but setting aside the time and the resource, um, and uh, nurturing a, a culture of, of learning and continuous um, inquiry. Uh, and 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 again, engaging at a very uh, sort of individual level across your organization around why it's important to gather data, what data is being gathered um, and and enabling people to set aside time to do it. Mm. Thanks, Nancy. Um, I'm just going to take the opportunity just because we've got a few minutes left just to um, note one of the questions in the chat here. So after the um, after the webinar today, uh, probably tomorrow because it's night time in Australia, um, uh, we'll send around um, a set of resources and some practical things that you can kind of dive into around this. So um, your question, Sarah, around could you provide a list of good resources? They are coming your way. Um, but I want to just, um, I want to kind of open it up a little bit more um, here to um, ask Ruth, there's a question in the, um, from one of the participants here about, about um, oh, oh, it's from Jenny Costello. Hello, Jenny. Um, asking about um, what are um, some, I suppose, conventional indicators or less conventional indicators you might use for, um, for assessing progress within your platform. Thank you so much for your question, Jenny. And really shirking tradition has been a learning journey for me. So it's just something I'm, I'm starting to realize I really need to do because I've been a traditionally, I have some traditional training in impact measurement. And I think especially in the MSP, in the multi-stakeholder platform space, those traditions can be kind of grounding, you know, and holding on to them can feel comfortable when things are so ambiguous. 
And actually some of the traditions that I've found, and actually Nick and Cam have helped me on this learning journey, I've learned to let go of are some things around language. So things like increased access to Y in X doesn't always help, you know, in, in the in the in the multi-stakeholder platform space. Um, other things like immediate outcomes being just around mindset changes or um, knowledge changes aren't always helpful. So what has been an example, because you asked for an example, is it doesn't sound necessarily not traditional, but how to pick which indicators to use has been less traditional, I think. So um, one is we, we create these action roadmaps and our indicator is, are people using the action, action, action roadmaps? And the way we get there is looking at the results chain and all the steps that are results. And first, you know, they have to get created and then they have to be collaborative and then they have to be, um, oh, people have to be aware of them and actually reading them. But, but the thing that really indicates that we're making a difference is are people actually using these, these reports and these roadmaps. Um, so I hope that answers your question a little bit. I think our indicators end up being a little bit more, um, maybe not a traditional, um, but it's about the process to get there. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ruth. And, and the, some of those challenges are really important. We, we've spoken about them in different ways in this session today, but that's some about the foundations um, of, of, of the, the foundations of platforms and partnerships and how do you really hang on to those as something to take um, keep track of. Um, I'm really conscious of time, so I'm interested in like a, a, a kind of, uh, I suppose, a soundbite from each of you um, in answer to what would you do first? What's the first thing that you would do um, when you're developing a learning and evaluation system? Nancy, I'm going to start with you. Engage your stakeholders. It's the first thing you start to talk about is 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 bringing this in so that everyone is attuned to the language and what it means to do continuous learning and evaluation. Mm -hmm. uh, and the second one is to benchmark now. It might be really easy. Just what is the situation analysis of where you're at? Mm. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, spend some time figuring out where you are um, and get everyone engaged. That's that. that. I think those are the first steps now. Let's see if we should, we should shut this down now. Um, Georgie, what would you do? Right off the back of that, start wherever you are. Um, so I totally agree with Nancy. Uh, based on what's most valuable for you to know where, wherever you are. This is all an iterative process. Mm -hmm. um, I think secondly, mapping the journey with a simple project plan so people understand where they're going with you. Um, and thirdly, celebrate, celebrate, celebrate small wins. Yeah. Any wins, really. Um, Jess, I'm interested from your perspective, you showed us the journey that you went on before while developing those programs. But what's the first thing you would do with all that hindsight um, learning in your back pocket? Yeah, I mean, apart from all the brilliant points that everyone has highlighted, I'll say really get a, get clarity about what the partnerships are there to do. So to the extent that people can um, describe whether they are to fill a gap, an organizational capacity gap, whether they're there to do transformational change will dictate your evaluation and learning approach towards that. Um, and other, other than that, I will say that generally um, what I tend to focus when evaluating learning um, and setting up a culture around it um, for partnerships is really pay a lot of attention in how you identify partners. So a partner assessment, the degree of operational and strategic alignment to start with. So even before you're going to partnerships or fund them, I think doing a lot of that really sets you up for success. Um, and then watching the degree of integration across processes, um, project management, but particularly the creation and flow in between partners and organizations around evidence and learning, I will say is really key. Um, and yeah, don't get this courage. You know, as I say, sometimes you might start just with very basic data around what you're doing together, but that will be potentially very interesting to um, spend some time. And it might be just, you know, input and activity data. You're still not working with outcome data, but that might enable that kind of systemic um, business as usual engagement with the partners around you know what is happening what is emerging and what does that mean for a practice um and and i can i think that relates to that journey um point um that we're all making right yeah 
Thank you, Jess. That's really helpful. I can see some questions. Thanks, Nancy, for answering that in the chat as well. And Cam, final word to you then. What's the first thing that you would do to get started in, in this space? Oh, I, I think everybody has, has, has mentioned it well. Start anywhere. Uh, start somewhere which makes sense to you. Um, build interest, get people excited, build those allies, get people involved, talk about it as much as you can um, and be ready to get it wrong. Uh, be ready to pick indicators that nobody likes. Uh, be ready to, to make mistakes, and that's okay. It keeps people talking about it. It opens it up and it gets people engaged. So start somewhere, make mistakes, talk about it. Thank you, everyone on the panel. Thank you, everyone who's joined us today. Um, we, As I said, we'll send around some materials um, to kind of further your interest and, and thinking in this space. And if you are, hopefully, one of the interested people in learning about multi-stakeholder platforms and partnerships, we need a better, we need a better title. This is too long to say. Um, then we're going to hopefully join, bring a group of people together in some form of community of practice. So uh, look out for some communications from us. And thank you very much for joining us um, today.